I'm super excited. Sarah Fisher, here she is. Da -da 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 -da! Is here with me on the sofa. I'm very, very excited to have Sarah along. Um, lovely, lovely person. If you've not met her, you might have heard of her. You might have heard of how lovely she is and all the cool <laughs> stuff that she does. Cheers. Um, <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Um, so we'll talk more in a second about the cat in the video. Cool. Um, but first of all, a very short introduction there in the video about what, I guess, an introduction to Tea Touch and what it is. But give us your kind of rundown on what is Tea Touch, because it sounds... It doesn't really tell you what it is, does it? Touch. What is it? It's quite hard to describe it really, but essentially it's an amazing technique that's used to work with all sorts of behavioural issues and also for anybody that interacts with animals yep. through their work or anything. And it's a way of using a combination of body work, ground work in the case of horses or dogs and some specific equipment to lower stress, release tension in the body and improve physical balance, which in turn improves mental and emotional balance. Wow, there you go. It's like a complete picture. This is perfect. It so, is. with the cat there in the video, that's pretty much, apart from the groundwork you were talking about, that's pretty much addressed everything you've, you've talked about just then, right? Yes. So, tell us what, what happens next in the video. I mean, because the, the video, we could actually probably see more of the video, but what, with that particular case, how does the touching and the contact help the cat? Because I guess you could argue, I'm playing devil's advocate, right? You could argue that if the cat doesn't want to be touched, why do we carry on touching it, right? Sure. That's a really that valid helps. point. But all animals need to be handled at some point for veterinary checks, for health checks. And also that is essentially why most people want an animal, yeah. because they want that tactile, tactile relationship. Yeah. And also an animal that doesn't like to be touched is normally carrying tension in their body. So it's not just touch that is concerning to them. They have other fears that yes. influence other aspects of their life. Yeah. And animals that don't like to be touched are often really tight through the back mm -hmm. and really tight through the hindquarters. And when we can change the way we touch the animals and use the back of the hand to initiate that contact or start with a feather on a long schooling stick so that you're a further distance from the animal yes. we can start changing that tension in that animal's body and make contact more pleasurable for the animal yeah. but we don't want to force it on the animal and you must always be mindful when we're interacting with an animal we're doing something with them not just to them and i guess secondary to that also it's not just about the them liking being touched it's actually reducing that tension that the touch actually becomes a part of doesn't it so you know when you've got tension it's, and it's true of people too, right? It is the same. Or I don't have my neck touched, or don't touch me on my head, or, or I can't stand my arms being touched. Same deal, right? It, and, it is. And it's not just about being touched, it's the fact that because they're so tense, the touching exacerbates the tension. Absolutely, and you get this vicious cycle. Mm. And also it's very hard then to get a correct diagnosis mm. if you've got an underlying medical problem because the animal is so stressed yeah. through any handling process anyway. And if we, with, with the touches, because it's using very specific movements on and with the animal's body, if we can start to release the tension, you can start to isolate where that problem area may be yeah. so that you can then say, actually, I think this may be a case where the animal has got an injury, I need to go and consult a vet. And you can pinpoint more accurately where that level Absolutely. of tension may be stemming so from. So with our lovely cat that we saw there, Ori, who by I the loved time Ori. we came out, was loving it, really. Well, not loving it, but certainly she much more accepting. And, and she ended up loving it. And it was a really, really short time period that we had to film in. Yeah. If I'm filming with an animal, I don't want to um, force an animal to do anything. And also, if I'm not going to get the result that we want, yes. I still want that aired, because yes. that is yes. the reality of working with animals Absolutely. and I don't want owners thinking they're a failure or their animals a failure if they can't get a quick or that things result in 30 minutes like we see absolutely in yeah. and so we literally had 10 minutes to film and we just did what we could do to help that cat be less stressed and to present herself better in the cattery to increase her chances of finding yeah. a home and within minutes she was purring as I was able to then work all around her head, all around her ears. Fantastic. Interesting though that you use a feather with cats. Is that, is that just cats that use a feather for other stuff? Do they not get predatory instincts where they go, what the hell is that? It was a bird. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> of course they do. But again, people need to look at, is it a play behaviour? Yeah, yeah, or right. is it part of high adrenaline stress. in the body yeah. and therefore linked to stress? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes if the animal's really, really touch sensitive, I might use two feathers on two ones so that we can stroke with one and the animal can play with it uh -huh, if they need uh -huh. to yeah. while we're then starting to initiate contact gotcha. with the other. But soft paint brushes work, we mm -hmm. can use those for all animals. Feathers on birds, fantastic yeah. to start handling animals like parrots yeah. again yeah. because touch is important. Yeah, it absolutely. really, really is important. I think it's one of the, it's the white elephant in the room that nobody really ever talks about, like pain, uh, borderline hypothyroidism yep. and I guess touch. Absolutely. Know, such an impact. I, I often just as an experiment, 
when highlighting these sorts of points, and I talk about t testing, I don't know what it is, and I say, well, look, you know, you've got to you've got to look at Sarah's stuff. But as a, in fact, you could do this at home now. So grab your your, your hand like this, and with the uh, with your little finger, because that's the smallest bit. Just go ahead and very very gently just run along the the inside hand here between uh, from your wrist here towards in between the thumb and your knuckle, and you can you can really feel that. Yeah. Just even just really really lightly, and the impact that just that one tiny finger has, and it's you huge. can feel that. And it's quite significant, you know, and if you do it gently enough, you can, I'm feeling it kind of up here too, you get that sort of tingly thing. Now imagine when you're stroking a dog like this, how that feels. And you can have just the, a huge impact with just tiny, tiny movements. And you're, you were teaching me before, because my dog, one of my dogs, has been to see Sarah. Wonderful, he loved it, <laughs> like really loved it. I was all a bit sort of tense and then by the end of it, <laughs> Sparko on the floor. And I've been using some of the stuff that Sarah was teaching my dog for now and it helps him hugely. And there's more to come here, yeah, but we'll talk about them in the future, uh, the future videos. But you, you're a big proponent of using the back of your hands. To start, you? yeah, to initiate contact with mm -hmm. the back of the hands. With all animals? Definitely. Right. Be normally because it's a new experience for the animal, they won't have an expectation of the palm of the hand coming and grabbing. Mm. It's less likely that you're going to lean on the animal yes. with the palm of the hand yes. or pat the animal or go into your own habitual response, which yes. if the owner's a little bit anxious is often to sort of scratch and scratch at the animal and yes. ruffle it around the ears if it's a dog. Yes. But that's really stimulating to the mm. nervous system. And that's what we're working with with T-Touch, the nervous system. And we want to often turn down the volume on that nervous system and therefore reduce the, the anxiety that may be triggered by more forceful handling even if it's well intentioned on our part. So the calm slow stroking with the back of the hand will enable the animal to settle more quickly, yeah. enable it to be more accepting of contact without feeling threatened yeah. but it will also enable you to pick up temperature changes through the body and they're significant as well. Fearful animals have cold feet. Yeah. And that's what we say if we're worried about something, we say, well, I've got cold feet about that. So it's all logical stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about circulation, tension, blocked awareness, so that, that pain often as well. Having cold feet, that's a really old saying. So exactly. is T-Touch new? I mean, is it a new thing that's only just come about? Or? It's been around for 32 years. And Linda Tennington Jones <laughs> developed it for 32, <laughs> actually, it's probably 33 years. Time goes so quickly. And she learned some very gentle massage techniques from one of her grandfathers, right. and then started with a gentleman called Moshe Feldenkrais, who taught the importance of working with the nervous system to change habitual behavior right. and postural traits in humans. And she adapted some of those principles to her first horses and had extraordinary results, and started to look at the dynamics of the problem animal with new eyes. And from there, it's now a technique that we use for all animal species, including snakes, birds, Wow. Rabbits. So what are the applications of that? I mean, th that's a, an amazing exam uh, uh, explanation of what it is and, and how it works and what it does. But so, so where can you apply it? What can you do with it? Do what you want with it. And, and, no, it was, uh, and yeah, to who? A, a, a applicable for any situation where there's handling of animals. So not just stress. Not just stress. It's a great so way to connect it. with the animal. Right. And also, oh, it's so very. Also, if, you, if your dog or your cat or your rabbit or your horse or your guinea pig or whatever doesn't have a behaviour problem, you have a lovely relationship with them. You can still learn yes. to touch and to enhance that bond, yes. make them feel calm. I mean, oh, this is nice, Mum. It gives you more tools to interact with your animal. And again, that's why we have animals. We mm. want that relationship. We we want that partnership yeah. and most people that study T-Touch when they greet an animal that's unknown to them if it's safe for them to touch the animal and the animals move towards them they will start doing the circular touches instead of going hello yeah, yeah, yeah. and you think you know the patting and the stroking is pleasurable for us mm -hmm. but sometimes it's quite crude and gross yeah. and these lovely touches are so much more sensitive and you can get a lot of information and it's rewarding for both the giver and the receiver. We talk about that here actually on Best Game Live um, a lot that for example, um, I personally, I'm a big proponent of um, if you have a reactive dog or an aggressive uh, a dog demonstrating aggression for other dogs or people, not letting them off the lead where there are other dogs and, and people, but to keep them on the lead and do some stuff with them here. Yes. And owners often say to me, well, but he won't be able to run around the field or if you're teaching a dog not to pull and, it, and you only ever get to the end of the road, but it takes you half an hour of lots of you know, thinking and learning. And they seem to have a big deal about that. And I always say, but who's the walk for? The walk yes. for the animal, isn't it? Or for the dog in that case. It's not for you. You know, if you only see your street ten times, it doesn't really, you know, on a short term, it's not gonna have a big deal for the dog, is it? You know, they don't necessarily I'm sure they love walking around the woods and all the rest of it, but they don't have to. No. And I guess 
That's um, the same for, um, for T-Touch in, in many ways, that it's about shifting that focus, isn't it? It's about what yes. is the animal experiencing here and how can we influence that, right? Yes, and also for a dog like you're describing, that's where the groundwork would be perfect because you could do it in quite a small area if the owner only has a small garden or yard mm -hmm. and do some really slow, considered movements because most dogs, in my experience, that are reactive to either people or dogs are tight through the hindquarters. Right, right. So hip dysplasia, got to be ruled out first and anything that yes. may be um, triggering pain yes. absolutely but they're often very rigid in the body yes. so through the groundwork and the body work if you can handle them because some dogs don't like contacts at first you can yeah. increase the flexibility through the body which naturally then increases the flexibility through the brain wow. giving the animal more choices in the way it expresses so itself touching but also um, ground really slow well. consider groundwork uh, those are the it's like doing yoga for the dog Yoga. Yeah, oh, cool. it's great yeah. for dogs on reduced exercises. Uh, on reduced exercise, fantastic. Cause it takes quite a lot of yeah. mental thought to organise the body in a slow, considered manner. Wow. So it's fantastic. Well, listen, we've had somebody ask a question. Can I read it? Yeah? Absolutely. Right. Okay, so uh, Donna, Donna Louise um, says uh, she's definitely going to try that feather technique with my cat Shadow. Great. A tenor that Shadow's black. Right. <laughs> my cat Shadow, as he's a very nervous cat, hides all the time when anyone comes in. Okay, similar yeah, very him, similar. Right? Um, very good way of my friends and family to interact with Shadow Definitely. without scaring him. Hopefully we'll build up his confidence. Um, amazing work. So that, that, Great. that's ideal for her, isn't it? Yeah, remember to do it slowly. The video was shot some years ago and we've, we've refined it. We've worked way more slowly. Right. It still worked right, and right. we were working more quickly. Yes. But be, you practice as well. Okay, people might think you're a little bit crazy, but practice so that the stick with the feather on becomes an extension of your arm yes, nice because you want it to be fluid, yeah, yes, yeah. And, and a na natural calm movement. And I noticed that actually with, and I think that's why um, it looks like massage. Doesn't it does it? look like massage. But it's not, it's not. It at all. So tell us the difference between, so why is it not massage? We're not causing friction. I used to do massage. I trained for three years doing massage Ooh, for humans. Have a look at that <laughs> So massage is really creating friction mm -hmm. and releasing tension in the underlying tissues. You're mm -hmm. looking at the attachment and origins of the muscles and ligaments and things. And T-Touch is really mainly working with the skin, right. which is the biggest part of connective tissue yes. on the animal's body and yes. on the human body. And we're also work doing slides along the ears to lower heart rate and respiration. Okay. So we're looking to move the animal's body in a non-habitual way. We've all got habits, yeah. so do the animals. If you cross your fingers one way, you'll always do it that way. And then if you try and do it the other way, so your thing, you fingers are interlocking the other way, it takes more thought yeah, and it feels right. slightly different, yeah. feels slightly different. Yeah. And that's what makes the brain pay attention to that part of the body. It's the fact that something's non-habitual. Therefore, we can change habitual responses to stressors out there in the and big so wide world. Because it's not, it's almost a, I keep using massage as an analogy because I guess it's... It does look like massage, it does look like it. Does look like it. Um, but it's not, definitely not massage because it's completely different techniques, aren't they, for a start. But it's, it's very gentle, isn't it? It really is. And I guess that's for um, uh, Don Louise when you're, when you're using the wand, you call it, don't yes. you? Yes. Um, I guess that's what you have to think, isn't it? Just very calm, yeah. and patience and... And that in itself has a huge impact on the animals we work with, doesn't it? And remember to breathe, breathe out. If you mm. breathe out, you'll naturally breathe in. Yes. Because our tendency when we're worried or we're working with an animal yeah. that we think might kick off or Increase strike, yeah, we'll get more tense, we'll yeah. hold our breath and that will immediately transfer through yeah. your arm or through the wand or through the lead if you're taking your dog out for a walk. So what sorts of, on a daily basis, because you have this amazing farm, it is brilliant, up near Bath, I love it, I love it, and my dog loved it. Um, and he had a, such a lovely time, it's very cool. Um, what sorts of things do you see on a daily basis over at Tilly Farm? Basically, it boils down to, is the animal feeling safe or unsafe? And right. that's it. And that's what really what anybody's dealing with if mm. they're working with animals. Yeah. Uh, in terms of dogs, the biggest problems, that, or the most common problems, are rea reactivity towards other people mm -hmm. or other dogs. Sometimes, obviously, the animal's reactive to both. For horses, it's linked to poor performance normally, but again, it's linked to poor posture. Right. So the horse's head, when it's up, yeah. because of poor muscle, yeah. inappropriate tack fit, poor training, it's pushed the horse into the flight-fight reflex. There's nothing the horse can do, it is yeah. going to be more spooky. Yeah, yeah, right. So we will have horses that are difficult to mount, tend to bolt, yeah. nap, 
maybe clingy, and separation anxiety for horses and dogs as yeah. well, yeah. and cats that don't like to be touched. So They're the most we, common problems. Actually, we've got, I'm kind of skipping ahead a bit, because um, one of the questions that I have a little bit later on, which I was going to ask you if you don't mind... No, not at all. ...to help handle What of actually is about separation anxiety? Common problem. But you know, if this is all about sort of tactility and touching and the relationship you have with your, your animal, how do you begin to help separation anxiety because the whole point about separation anxiety is when you're there with the animal they're absolutely fine but when you're not there you're not how do you do t-touch if you're not there t-touch uh, helps to build self-confidence in the animal so the we can help the animal become more confident in his own body rather than just drawing confidence from us right. and again the dogs that i see more commonly with separation anxiety tend to be tight through the hindquarters mm. which goes with that nervous timidity can make them noise sensitive. Mm. They often have colder feet, they're naturally more nervous. Mm. And they're often actually quite tight through the jaw. And it's the same with humans. Animals carry a lot of tension through their jaw and we don't pay much attention to the animal's head mm. in terms of training unless we're using toys or food reward. Mm. And they'll often have cold ear tips as well. Again, in that flight, fight reflex, yeah, yeah, more yeah. the flight reflex at that point. So we're looking to reduce stress so that the animal is calm whether we're there or not. Yeah. And you'll start obviously working with the animal, give him that 10, 15 minutes, five minutes of tea touch so that he feels really relaxed. And you're, you're looking to see, does that animal have to follow you every time you move yes. in the house, when you go from room to room? Yeah. And then using other tools that incorporate the tactile system, obviously, like the Thunder Shirt, yes. Yes. to teach the animal that he can be safe on his own. Yeah. I've got a Staffordshire Bull Terrier that we initially fostered because he needed surgery for a luxating patella. And he became more clingy following surgery right. because of the tension through yeah, the hindquarter. Yeah, yeah, and we've now finally adopted him actually because we, he, nobody came forward to take him on. And now that he's settled and now his body's healing and he's in better physical balance, yeah. separation anxiety is just diminishing. That's brilliant, isn't it? So, so many, many different applications of, of yes. T-Touch, of animals and people. That's what I love about it. Um, and, uh, and there are many practitioners all across the country. So there if are. you want to know more about T-Touch, what can you do? Is it, and bearing in mind that like, most of our viewers, in fact, maybe all of them are owners. Um, so where, where can they learn more about it if they want to do perhaps on their own animal? Or where can they come see you or um, learn more about you? They can visit the website at www.ttouch.co.uk and that has the list of current Guild members, people that have trained with us down at the farm near Bath. And also a lot of our practitioners teach one day workshops. That's a great introduction to T-Touch and also the six day practitioner training clinics. And you can join a six day training clinic even if you don't want to go on to become fully trained in T-Touch. But what we find is people do come and then they become so addicted to the work, which is exactly what happened to me, that they want to come and learn more and more and more. And that's where I'm going. I'm off. You are, yeah. I'm, I'm going there. I'm going to go and have a little look at, uh, at Teach Touch. We like using lots of different things, and the, the best um, practitioners of any field have a nice wide knowledge Definitely. of different things, and that's just what Teach Touch is perfect for. It's a really quite significant tool, not just a little one, but it's a, it's a big tool to keep in your bag that you can dip in and out of and use, as we've seen today, in, in many different examples. So, listen, we've got um, very quickly um, a uh, very quick Q&A. Um, very, very quick, is that right? Am I good? Okay, I'm just double checking. Um, I'm not used to being in charge, it's very, very uncomfortable for me, as I'm sure you can imagine. Straight your ears. Yeah, straight straight your ears. <laughs> can you straight? No, don't. Um, so, a couple of quick questions. Shell, um, or Shelley maybe, it probably is Shelley, um, says, I've got two intact males, um, they always get on. We moved to Swindon and all they do is fight, and we're getting them done, I imagine being castrated, but wondered if there's anything else we can do as well. So, um, Sarah's going to stick around and um, help me with these. The um, first thing is that quite often when you move houses there can be some disruption. So it doesn't say how often. If you move in the last week, I wouldn't jump into castrating them as a solution. Um, just let it all settle down. You know, when you move different environments, when things are still a bit up in the air, when there's boxes everywhere, different smells, different environments, then behaviour of all animals can change. Cats are particularly susceptible to that. Um, and interestingly enough, rabbits. But um, uh, dogs are a bit, a bit more adaptive, I would say, than, than cats. Um, however, you have to ask why you're getting them castrated, because castration generally isn't, um, I mean, in owner-directed aggression, it has a 25 to 30% improvement in owner-directed aggression, but in other aggressions, isn't that great an improvement. Um, it, it is true that testosterone uh, is linked to aggressiveness. Um, however, 
the extent of that is not as great as people think. Quite often people go in, they castrate the animal, and then they come see a behaviourist yep. and say it didn't work. Um, and as with all of these things, there's no magic wand. Um, you know, I'm sure you would be happy with me saying that T-touch isn't a magic wand, seeing um, a behaviour cancer necessarily isn't um, a, a magic wand. They're all, you've got to use lots of different yes. things together to support the change of the animal. So, um, uh, that I would say, if you've only just moved, just wait. Secondly, um, ask yourself why you're castrating them. And thirdly, you don't necessarily need to castrate them, providing that you're um, supporting either the eldest or the um, most you know, socially appropriate. Because often it's social structure problems that yes. causes interdog dog um, aggression. So either the eldest or the, the recumbent is the one that should, I use something called 95% rule. So 95% of the time you should be supporting the natural social structure. But what would you say, Sarah, though? How would you help out with that too? Also looking at have things changed in their body and that's the other really useful um, thing that owners can learn to do is just get used to touching their animals because they'll highlight things that are changing long before it becomes either a serious physical problem or a serious behavioural problem. Yeah. So the change may have um, triggered tension in the body. Dogs that tend to get quite reactive to each other often really tight through the back. Mm. They may be hotter through the lumbar area yep. and also things like hip dysplasia, yep. Arthritic changes that can trigger it too. Lots of dogs that are reactive are really tight around the base of the tail. Gotcha. So also the age of the animal and is there less space now? And do the okay. conflicts happen through the entry and exit points as well? We're looking at all of that and using T touch then to lower stress, give valuable one-to-one -one yeah. time to the, each animal, and to be able to teach them that they can stay calm and that if there are little sparks in their behaviour, that the recovery rate is quicker. Gotcha. So that we lower adrenaline, lower heart rate much more quickly if it's safe to obviously touch them when they're in a state of arousal. Um, Amanda asked about tip for separation anxiety. We're going to put um, my five point plan for separation anxiety on the website, on, on Facebook, so you can look at that. But also, we've heard already today how actually using T Touch to help just reduce anxiety yes. and give confidence yes. to the individual dog can help with, with um, separation anxiety too. And also right. to give the owner tools in the, in the way that they can handle the animal in a really pleasurable but neutral way so it's not yes. clingy because a lot of those dogs are saying, touch me, touch me, touch me, and they're gotcha. almost trying to climb inside you all gotcha. the time. Gotcha. And just stroking or just patting them doesn't satisfy yes. that yes. In, insecurity. Yeah. And, and groundwork too for, for issues like that yeah. because a lot of dogs that have separation anxiety won't yeah. let anybody else take the lead. Yeah. Yes. They want to stay with their owner and they'll hug the owner's leg. Okay. So we'll sometimes start introducing the concept of another person mm -hmm. being a valuable part of that dog's life by introducing them through groundwork. So we have two people handling that dog, the owner, so they've got that contact with their lead and then a T-Touch practitioner Brilliant. working with a long line if that's appropriate with the second with the Brilliant. And there are second you can handler. see you yeah. doing that on YouTube or something, can't you? I don't know. Have I seen a video? There's that photos somewhere? probably around, photos, yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, lastly, because we've got to crack on, but I will, I promise, I will take a look at these on Facebook and provide a personal um, just quick answer because I've run over to, I'm, I'm really bad at this. This is why Joe should be here because I just keep going on. Um, uh, Cindy um, says she's got a one-year-old Jack Russell that chews on his paws. She said, I know this is a common thing for these dogs. Um, however, I would say actually, I don't think it is. But it's not normal even if it is um, you know, seen in more dogs than others. However, he yelps to such a degree it's unbearable. Please give me some advice. Um, it's really difficult, Cindy, because there's so many questions I would need to ask. It could be something we call acral lip dermatitis, which is a behaviour problem that sometimes manifests as a, um, a clinical problem. Could be due to anxiety or problems locally with his pores. Could be even um, a degree of separation anxiety. But um, one thing is don't punish or reward uh, or reinforce in any way the, the licking on the pores, right? Distract the behaviour, so get him to do something else, and then obviously reinforce that behaviour. Um, and uh, it does, if it only happens when you're there, it could well be an attention-seeking disorder, a compulsive disorder that's, that's um, developed. But you have a really great um, immediate practical solution that Cindy can do now, can't you? Yes. Which is? First of all, check for tension in the neck as well if it's the front paws, because okay. often it can be to do with tension in the neck or back, depending if mm -hmm. it's front or hind limb. But also get a little cool flannel, and if he's happy for you to lay that on his paws, put that over the area that's irritated, and use your fingertips to really lightly do tiny, tiny one and a quarter circles around the area that he's irritating, because that helps to reduce the itch without further damaging the skin, which is what he's doing when he's nibbling and licking at his paws all the time. It can be a really useful tool for flea allergies and all sorts of things, including new wounds as well, to take that itch out without causing further damage, which really then good. just exacerbates that cycle. 
She's got it all. There you go, it's Sarah Fisher from the T-Touch team. You can have a little look, we're gonna post um, a video of the tortoise uh, on our website. There is a picture, uh, a video of Sarah working with a tortoise getting it out of his shell. It's mind blowing stuff, it's fantastic. It's a great example of all the different things you can use. Sarah Fisher, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and after this very, very quick link, we have Mrs. Stagbar. Oh, no, a stink, that's what I meant. A very quick link, uh, we've got Mrs. Stagbar. So the lady who invented, well didn't invent because they're natural, but who just first decided that people could use uh, horns for dogs, straight after this. <laughs>